second place in World Cup 2006. In November 1997, Australia's best chance of qualifying for the World Cup final since 1974 came to a dramatic climax against Iran at the MCG. Johnny Warren was commentating on the match. We're well and truly on the way to France now, Paul. He, he had the, the total picture as to what that night against Iran was going to give the game in this country. Forward again to lunging, saving tackles. They've lost the ball. Bosnich is out and he's gone. Around the score. They say, Paul, the most dangerous score to lead by is 2 0 because uh, you appear to have the match wrapped up. The other team get one back, even though it hasn't been deserved on tonight's uh, general play. I really felt for Johnny during that Iran game, during the second half, because he had to sit there and co commentate in a calm and measured tone when he could see that it was falling apart. And suddenly the complexion of the game changes. Let's hope it doesn't, but this is the best period for Iran in the match. Ali Doi, danger for Australia here, the flag's down! It's an equaliser for Iran! Iran scored twice late in the second half to go through to the World Cup on the away goals rule. Disaster. Australia's pain was overwhelming even for the Iranians. I'm really sorry, really. I know Johnny Warren. I met last night another fabulous guy, Adrian. Adrian I know that, I, I, I know that that team, 7-4, have been together yesterday, and I know how these people now are suffering. I know how Australian kids who play football are suffering now. I tell you the truth, if we had a winner here, it should have been Australia. For those interviews, Johnny Warren. The cameras came back on us and I started to talk and uh, turned to Johnny and uh, the rest is history. You just feel for them, not just the boys, they are representative of so many people who make this game their life. It's just, uh, I can't say anything. Right? What he saw after his 30 year struggle was another chance for the rest of the country to disrespect the game. For Johnny, the devastating disappointment simply meant working harder on his mission. He used to work so hard and he was always on the go, always always on, on the radio, on the TV, travelling here and there. It was a non-stop event for him. His life was just a, this circle that, that just kept going and going and going and going. It needed to a bit of a slowdown. There was a time where I did, I did feel that um, family came second. I did. Uh, but... I mean, he was so passionate about the sport. <sighs> he lived it. He loved it. He he thrived on it, and he wasn't happy unless he was he was he was doing what he was doing. He worked immensely hard, uh, both doing what he was doing, and at the same time doing his job to promote the book, the the work of his life, the one that he always wanted to bring out for as long as I knew him called Sheila's Wogs and Puftas. He couldn't get anybody to publish the book because of the title. And he said, well, I'm not changing the title. Eventually, Random House picked it up and ran with it. And I bet they're glad that they ran with it. It's a thrill to say it's now officially launched. Sheila's Wogs and Puftas, well done, Johnny. And, uh, but it, it also could have resulted in him, well, it did result in him neglecting himself until it was basically too late. In November 2002, after a year of near impossible commitments, Johnny was diagnosed with lung cancer. He was given just three months to live. I'll never forget the time when uh, he came around and he said, uh, I've got cancer. And I said, uh, I started crying. And he said to me, Noddy, after this day, never cry again for me. And I said, I, I won't but I lied. It has been a huge shock um, and a lot of support from a lot of people, none the least being SBS and yourself and the, the, the guys here who are really like family, so it's been a tough, tough time. Well, good to see you, Joe. When he was diagnosed with cancer and he, he didn't was, ask why me, why now, but he decided to add that to the message he was preaching and also bring the man the, to the man 
to the males the message that they should look after their health as well because you know you can dedicate your life to one thing only or mostly and and then neglect yourself what's necessary to your well-being he saw it pretty much as another mission he had in life the fight against cancer was to benefit from Johnny's revered standing in the football world. His 60th birthday party at Sydney's Town Hall was a gala event called Kick a Goal for Cancer. He's always displayed a passionate interest in the development of soccer. As tributes flooded in from all corners of the globe, it was testimony to the huge influence Johnny Warren had established throughout the football world. Ironically, Johnny's illness had lent his football mission a sense of urgency. It's the game of the world, game of the people, and we are going to win the battle. A government-ordered inquiry called the Crawford Report had recommended a radical overhaul in how the game was run. Johnny knew billionaire businessman Frank Lowy was the right man to head up a new football federation. Alongside influential colleagues such as John Singleton, he campaigned to convince Lowy to take it on. Yeah, because I remember one meeting he said, Frank, if you don't do it, who can? I don't have the capacity to do it. We're going to get... Um, this is a business. It's the world game. We need a, a world beater. We need a world-class business bloke. If not, you who? And you got when you're a young man, you tried and you failed. Now we've got a clean sheet of paper in this Crawford report. The Prime Minister wants you to do it. The soccer community wants you to do it unanimously. The football family wants you to do it. Your own family wants you to do it. How can you say no? You love the game as much as I do. The only difference was you were no good at it. Which Frank said he wasn't that bad. And uh, it was done. If it hadn't have worked, and there was plenty of rocky times when uh, it didn't look like it was going to turn out the way everyone wanted, he would, have suffered, he would have suffered more than anybody else. One of the most important developments brought in by the all-new Football Federation of Australia was the formation of the new National A-League, with one team per city. The A-League has worked absolutely splendidly. Uh, I had uh, my doubts and I went to the first game and the atmosphere was fantastic. It was absolutely amazing. There was no ethnic division. Such a change after years of tension at football games to go to a game where everyone barracks for the one team and hisses in the nice way the opposition as villains. You know, it's like watching a game overseas and, that, and it's been the same in every city. So, in that respect, the A-League has been an unqualified success. It's absolutely united football. The A-League draws bigger crowds nationally than the, than the Super 12, soon to be Super 14, which if you told me that, I would have... I bet if you told Foxtel that, they wouldn't have imagined it either, but that's, that's in season one. <laughs> I've got Kuehl, uh, Paducah, Swartz, uh, Bresciano. Everyone wants Johnny Warren. He's a legend. Come and get your World Cup T-shirts here. As Johnny saw the mission finally being realised, Les Murray called him while he was convalescing at home to tell him that he'd been awarded the FIFA Centennial Order of Merit, the highest football honour. He said, uh, thank you for being the bearer of such good news, but I really can't appear in public like this. I, I don't want to frighten the children. I said, well, that's your, that's your decision. And then he obviously thought about it because half an hour later he rang me back and he said, well, to hell with how I look. This is how I look at the moment and this is how people are going to have to accept me. But this is an, an honour I cannot allow myself not to personally accept. I believe he felt rewarded for the first time ever in his life fully rewarded, genuinely rewarded by football. I mean, he won all sorts of awards from governments and from the Queen and, and all sorts of people, but really never ever, ever from football.
In a tragic twist of fate, just as Johnny's vision was materializing, his body was deteriorating, and he died, surrounded by his friends and family, aged 61, on the 6th of November, 2004. Against the odds, he had survived two years with his disease. He was granted a full state funeral, the first ever in the field of sport. A state funeral means someone is of such significance to the whole community, and not just by playing his sport or by making a contribution to his sport, or even to his friends and colleagues. As you've heard, Johnny Warren was a very good player of football, but he was far above all others in putting back into the game so much more than he took out of it. It's quite, it's quite a strange feeling because uh, whilst he lived in Jamboree, he was always away doing something. And, you know, he might come back and he'd say, I'm off to Brazil for three weeks, or I'm off to to Perth or I'm off to somewhere, so, somewhere. so uh, even after uh, 12 months, you still expect him to come turn up. <laughs> yeah. So. Johnny Warren left football in a far healthier state than he found it. As well as the A-League, Australia will be incorporated into Asia's qualifying zone from 2006. And there are lower profile successes to help secure the future of the beautiful game. The Johnny Warren Foundation for Elite Players in New South Wales. The highly skillful indoor football called futsal. And women's football, the fastest growing sport in the world, all continue to reap the rewards of Johnny's passionate support. Perhaps more important is the spiralling popularity of the game at junior level, with kids taking it up in droves across the country. And of course, there was a night back in November 2005. It's Harry Kuehl who's going to go first for the Socceroos. Beautifully put away by Harry Kuehl. Two class, Harry. Rodriguez against Mark Swanson. Save by Swanson. Right He's done it again in the shootout. It's huge. When Mark Viduka missed his penalty, I thought, oh no, here we go again, you know, but, but thankfully Mark Schwartz had come to the to the forward, saved the next one. Oh, Big great save, save again, Mark Schwartz! Save. Wonderful save! Trying to do from that four side. 4-2, 4-2. He wins it for us. John. Here's Aloisi for a place in the World Cup. for us. He's yeah. When Aloisi scored the penalty, you know, we we've finally done it. 32 years we've been waiting and we've finally done it. In the biggest game of all, Johnny Warren! In the moment that we made it, I just instantly thought uh, about Johnny. To me, it was all about what he'd been advocating. Johnny Warren! At last! Whilst it wasn't within the rules of commentary, to me, it seems pretty appropriate now. Australia is back on the biggest stage. What a night! We miss him. We miss him a great deal because uh, the mission is still going on. It's not accomplished. I don't believe it will be accomplished until uh, Australia wins the World Cup one day and uh, everybody in this country appreciates the game just the way Johnny did. When I'm up at the big football field in the sky, I just want, want people just to remember I told you so. Walk on through the wind. Walk
Eastern State viewers are invited to join a web chat now.